we've all been discussing the fourth industrial revolution so much at this Davos. And um, it's clear that it brought us incredible empowerment, more information than we ever had before, more connectivity than we ever had before. And yet somehow, in many cases, we seem to know less. If you want to go and get the news, you'll probably go to a source online that confirms what you already believe now. And the danger is that you might be trapped in an echo chamber or a filter bubble. That magical thing called a shared experience, where we all come into the center to debate very complicated issues and challenge each other with new ideas, is rapidly disappearing. So the NGOs around the world, many of whom are here, do incredible work gathering statistics and data. But when it comes to humanizing that data and storytelling, they often lack the proper resources to do that. And then you've also, on the other side, got the global media. Well, the global media institutions are severely disrupted right now. And when it comes to investing heavily in human stories, they often lack the resources to do that too. So if I was to ask you um, an interesting question, who is the next Martin Luther King? Who is the next Gandhi? Who is the next Mandela? Who are the next heroes, leaders of our societies, for good reasons, who are actually household names that ordinary people like myself would know? Now, um, probably even in this room of enlightened people, even we wouldn't be able to come up with more than one or two names who are household names. Now, the great emerging leaders are out there, and they're doing great work, but their stories and their messages are getting lost in this white noise, and they're not seen, their voices aren't heard. So this is where someone like myself comes into it. I'm a storyteller, and I have a foundation called the People's Portfolio. And our job is to invest all our resources purely into storytelling. So we look at these fantastic emerging leaders now, and we try to give them an enhanced platform of leadership. We try to give them a megaphone so their voices break through this white noise that we're all experiencing. So there's one leader that I'd love to tell you about today. He's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize eight times. He's uh, time 100, um, and yet still many of us don't know his name. His name is Dr. Dennis McQuaige. So, um, He's a world-renowned gynecological surgeon. And around 1999, he set up a small hospital in Bukavu in uh, South Kivu province, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, the mission for this hospital was to help uh, local women have natural, healthy childbirths in a poor region. And one of his first patients ended up being something different. She came to the gates of the Pansy Hospital, and she needed extreme emergency help. She was suffering from being raped with extreme violence. So they operated on her and treated her, hoping that this was a fluke. Tragically, it wasn't a fluke. And it was the beginning of what we now call an epidemic of rape as a weapon of war. Now, every day on average, there's between 1 and 15 women that come to the gates of the hospital seeking treatment for sexual violence. And to give you a sense of scale, to this date since its inception, the hospital has treated 85,000 women, children, and even babies as young as two months old for sexual violence with extreme violence. So the doctor is my friend. I got to know him quite well over the last few years. And he came to me uh, for help. And he said, can you help me get this story out? But not in a statistical way, the way it's been presented before, but in a human way. And he invited me and my team to uh, the Congo to set up a studio in his hospital and help humanize this, this unbelievable story. So with your kind permission, I'd like to tell you about the trip that we did, and it begins here.
The Congo River Basin is the second largest rainforest in the world. So when we breathe, every breath we take, we take in Congo. Every breath we take, anywhere in the world, we're breathing air that was made in Congo. So we all have a stake in this. So, day one, I wake up on my first day of the trip. Our hotel is on Lake Kivu. So I walk down to the water's edge as the sun's coming up, and I'm in paradise. I hear tropical birds singing, beautiful plants everywhere. I look out onto Paradise Lake, and in the distance, I see a group of night fishermen finishing their night shift as sun rises. I can actually hear them singing songs to the fish. One of them paddles over to me in a canoe that he carved out of an old tree. And he says, my name is Zeus. I climb into his boat and uh, I take this picture. I said, um, Zeus, you live in paradise. I'm from New York. I've never seen such a beautiful place. And he said, you're wrong, my friend. It's beautiful to look at, but my personal life is nothing but darkness. He said, when I was a child growing up, I witnessed both my mother and father killed in front of me with machetes. He said, I'm looking for a better life. So in an hour or so, it was time to hit the roads and go in our convoy to the hospital to meet Dr. McQuaige. Uh, as we're driving on the streets, my fixer told me that the, uh, the DRC has um, a $24 trillion economy based on natural resource wealth. And as I looked out of my window of the car, I saw nothing but abject poverty. The roads were devastated. And I just thought to myself, my goodness, I don't think any of that money is going to the people. But I did see this poster of Dr. McQuaige in a shop, and I jumped out of the car uh, to get a picture of the, doctor, the doctor's image amongst his people. So we eventually made it to the gates of the hospital where all these women and children arrive each day. And I was greeted in open arms by my all-time hero. Here he is. This is the portrait that I made within an hour of meeting him at the hospital. Now, he's a man exhausted with the fight against rape as a weapon of war. And yet, when he's in the hospital doing what he was born to do, it's like he's 200% alive. And this is an icon that I hope the hospital will use to help amplify his voice around the world. And I said to him, Doctor, what makes you happy? And he said, my happiness is in the happiness of others. If I can lift a soul or a spirit, then I myself can be happy. So after I finished working with the doctor, this young lady came into my little photo studio that I set up. I'll introduce you to her. Her name is Esther, and this is her one-year-old son, Jose. I asked Esther to tell me her story. So she said, well, when I was 16 years old, she said she was fetching, uh, fetching water for her mother and father in a rural area outside Bukavu. Some troops, rebels called FDLR, they abducted her, grabbed her, and pulled her into a forest where they had their base camp. They tied her to a tree, and they all raped her for four days. On the fourth day, one of the rebels forgot to tie the ropes tight, and she managed to escape. She made it to a local village, and a man rescued her and brought her into his home for safety. But then he raped her as well. Eventually, she escaped again and made it to the gates of the Pansy Hospital 
to find out that she's now pregnant from the rape. And over a year later, here is her son, Jose. And he's calm and staring at me, probably because she gave him a little bit of bread in his hand that he once in a while chews on in the picture. Now, when she told me this, as I'm sure you're feeling, I was devastated. And I found it really difficult to keep my composure. Look at her face. She kept this stoic dignity as she told me this horrific story. And I said, Esther, how is it that you don't cry in my picture? I've never heard a story like this before. And she said, the reason I don't cry in your picture is because I don't want to make you sad. And I don't want to make anybody sad who sees this picture. She said, my mummy and daddy always told me when I was a child that I am here to bring joy to the world. And I will keep my promise. So, we finished this picture. And then I heard some noise outside this little booth that I'd set up. So I came outside to be confronted by this. This is the singing women of the Pansy Hospital. It's a multi-generational group, and they come together every day, and they write songs, and they sing songs about their adversity. One girl here is 13 years old. Another lady is in her 70s. It's the most beautiful evidence of sisterhood I ever saw in my life. And it's a sort of defiance of darkness. So I took them into the courtyard of the hospital, and as the sun came out, I got these sort of powder puff clouds. It was beautiful with the light. And they started singing and dancing. And it just reminded me of the strength that we have as human beings to overcome the worst adversity if we support each other and come together. Everywhere I went in the hospital, I saw women, children. I saw more children who were orphaned. I saw babies born of rape. But overall, this hospital is a beautiful place of healing. Now, as I photographed many women who were survivors of sexual violence, I obviously didn't speak their language, so we had to communicate in a different way. And once in a while, they did something, or I asked them to move their head slightly to one side, and it just created one of those powerful images that I live to take. And when they recognized my inspiration, they would all do something very similar. They would make a sound that was this. Mmm. Mmm. Brothers and sisters, this is the best sound I ever heard in my life. It's the sound I live for as a photographer because it's a sound of a deep connection with someone that I don't even speak their language. So I spoke to a, a, a lady called Dr. Nene, who's a, another surgeon at the hospital, and I was interested in this sound, and I asked her about why these women make this beautiful sound of confidence. She explained to me that the woman, in fact, to use her words, the African woman, she is a strong one. She said she is seen as the matriarch of not only the family, but the whole community. She rears the children, she feeds them, she inspires them with wisdom and educates them. She's also the biggest advisor to her husband. But outside the family unit, she's expected to be reserved. Yet she is still the best spiritual advisor for the family in public. So she has invented a secret language of subtle noises so she can still let her husband know and her children know what she's thinking. So I said, well, what would be the noise for joy? And she did what some of the women had done when they were dancing. She did, well, when there's a new baby born that's healthy in the family, we do this noise. Oh, la, 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 la. So then I said, what would the noise be uh, for a warning to her children or anxiety? And she did this. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So then I asked a difficult question. What is the noise of a woman who feels pain? And she did this. Hmm. Hmm. Then I asked a question about vulnerability. What does a woman do when she feels vulnerable? She said, once again, a woman in Africa 
is strong. She has no sound for vulnerability because she's not supposed to be vulnerable. When she's vulnerable, there is silence. So I was invited into a hospital ward filled with 30 women, all recovering from sexual violence. And there was silence, no noise. In fact, as I walked into this room for the first time in my life, I felt what it really is to be a man. And it didn't feel good. I was standing in this ward and I felt predatorial. On top of it, I had a camera as well. And I was rendered useless as a communicator for fear of offending and making the women feel even more vulnerable. Yet, I was invited there by the hospital to help tell you guys this story. So the only way I could function was to tune in on a human way with the doctor who was doing his rounds that morning. And I asked him to give me a little nod if it was okay for me to take a picture. But if he felt it's sensitive, I would lower my camera and bow my head and stand in the corner. So I worked with another NGO also called Physicians for Human Rights. And they've done incredible work in this hospital. Because what they've started to do is get the doctors to talk to the police force who also talk to the military tribunals. Now, when a doctor treats a woman, there's also evidence of her injuries. So they pass on the evidence to the police, who then arrest the perpetrator, and then they pass on the perpetrator with that evidence to the military tribunal. And only now can we start to close the circle of justice. This is Captain Bodelli. He's head of police in South Kivu, and he's one of the most courageous guys I've ever met. And he's made it his life's mission to fight rape as a weapon of war. So, look, I'm an outsider. I've never been to the Congo before. So I had to ask him a very basic question. I don't understand what rape as a weapon of war even means. And he said, it's brutally simple, my friend. Bullets cost money. Rape is free. He also confirmed what Dr. Nene had said to me, that the woman in Africa is the central axis of strength in the family and in the community. So if you hurt the woman, you disrupt her confidence in life, you break down the family unit. Even her husband feels humiliated because he couldn't defend her honor. So he feels lacking in strength. Now, if that permeates a whole society, society feels vulnerable and weak. They're less likely to stand up to oppressive rebels. Rebels are then able to control territory. And if you control territory, in the ground are so many semi-precious minerals that come from mines. And these semi-precious minerals power our mobile devices. So if we all thought this is a distant struggle, we suddenly begin to realize that our empowerment makes us stakeholders in this story because a large percentage of the semi-precious minerals that empower us come from the Congo. So the captain has made it his life's mission also to recruit women for the first time into the police force because they're much better equipped emotionally to deal with this delicate subject of rape. And here he is on a police march with all his lady soldiers behind him. But there are some problems with recruitment in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as I heard. Now, this guy uh, was a former child soldier and a former rebel, but he's now a policeman. But he's wearing a jacket from when he was a rebel, and it's starting to get difficult to tell who is a good guy and who is a bad guy. Here are a gang of police I photographed at the police station just one random morning. This is a bullet wound in one of their hand. Now, I heard rumors when I was there, there's been a lot of recruitment of rebels into the police force, which is, I suppose, a positive development. But the danger is that some of these rebels keep their uniform under their bed. So during the day, they police the streets, but at nighttime, they switch uniforms, become a rebel again, and devastate the same streets they were policing during the day. This is a rebel's weapon, a machete. This is the gate to hell. This is a police jail. And the jail cell 
these are the only elements of light that come into the dark room. And behind it are a whole group of men accused of sexual violence. The whole place stank. They were burning rubber tires in the courtyard. And as I walked in, I remember seeing this little boy who was having a seizure on the floor. And he was banging his head against the concrete. You know, he wasn't well, and the local hospital didn't want to take him. He was an orphan, so he was just left at the police station until they figured out what to do. And there were maggots everywhere and weird spiders, and then the darkness of the feeling of these eyes coming through the holes. I've never seen darkness like this before in my life. So we decided to hit the streets again, and we headed in my convoy into the mining district because we wanted to find out about the mines themselves. Now, I discovered after driving about 130 miles north into rebel territory, and this was a very dangerous area, I found some great news. There's a local charity in the area where there are tin mines that pumps money into local families, and that allows families to take their children out of the mines and put them into a school. I arrive at a local school, and I'm confronted with maybe two or 300 children and all their parents and teachers. And just for the record, I asked everybody to raise their hand if they ever worked in a mine. Every single person in this picture worked in a mine. Most of the parents still do. And the children ranged from five years old to 14. This little girl was six years old. She was so beautiful, has this beautiful openness as a soul. And I love her earrings. This is a 14-year-old boy with his mother. These three little girls, this is their classroom, so you can see how basic it is. This is the floor. Notice the T-shirt. She was given it uh, from a local charity shop that collects clothes from our part of the world, and she had no idea what the Playboy bunny was. She thought it's a bunny rabbit. And then these are all the children I photographed that morning as an epic lineup of heroes trying to defy their circumstances of adversity. So I wanted to meet some of the miners. So I met this lady, and her name is Vivian. She's the mother of four children. She's been a miner since she was 11 years old. She saw her husband killed in front of her by militia rebels from the FDLR. And they told me that they opened fire on her as she fled with her children. And the baby that she was carrying on her back got hit by one of the bullets. The baby survived, but remained severely handicapped. None of her children go to school. She's a miner in a mine called the Mukungwe Mine. And as far as I can tell, it's a gold mine. It's one of the most fought over mines in South Kivu. I was told that there's about 5,000 miners there. And according to OECD, there's extreme corruption. There's rebel activity. Lots of children work in this mine. And it's rife with sexual violence. Then I wanted to find a mine of positivity because I have heard that there is change and we need hope to cling to with this story. So I put the word out to see if there are any mine owners that have registered mines that are conflict free. No women, no children. This man stepped forward who owns a coffee plantation and he's recently discovered coltan and tin on his land. So he's opened up a brand new mine called the Luango Mine and he invited me and my team to go there to take pictures freely. This is coltan in the ground. Coltan is one of the minerals. So you have gold, tin, tantalum, cobalt, and coltan. These are the minerals that power our technology. This is one of the miners I pulled out of the ground in a ditch. This is a miner holding a rock with coltan in it. And the coltan are the black bits in the rock. Here is another miner. You know, all the dirt dries in the heat after they've been digging in the ditch, and it creates this unbelievable texture on the skin. This guy's name is Prince, and he was just so beautiful in front of the camera. So then they break down the rocks and create refined coltan, and that's what's being held in the hand here. Now, in a mine that's corrupt, what they do is they put this in sacks, and they smuggle it out through a porous border, and then it's smelted down in Southeast Asia and then distributed, and eventually it finds its way into our mobile technology. But it's almost impossible to trace the supply chain. Here is a miner again covered in mud, and this is my Apocalypse Now picture. This 
is the mine. So I was so excited when I got this picture because it's evidence of a positive mine, positive change, and we risked our lives doing this picture with my team. I mean, I brought all my young assistants and all their parents were slightly pissed off at me for exposing them to this danger. So when we got back, we thought we should do some fact-checking and some caption um, expansions, and we started researching this online. And you know what? We couldn't find any evidence that this mine even exists. We looked on all the websites that list all the conflict-free mines. No one had ever heard of this mine. So I was left with a difficult situation. Is it a real mine? I was there. I pulled these miners out of the ground. I think it was. Or is it a ghost mine? Could it have been set up by the government to throw me off course and give me the impression to tell the world that there's great positive change when maybe there isn't? Now, if I was a great journalist, and most of my friends are journalists, I would be slightly reluctant to engage with this picture for fear of publishing a picture when you can't verify the truth. No one wants to publish fake news these days. But the danger is that if we don't engage in this picture, because as journalists we're looking for straight facts, in the fog of a conflict like the Congo, there almost are no straight facts. The only straight fact I can find is that there are 85,000 women being treated in a local hospital over the last few years because they have the evidence of their treatment. So the danger is the media don't want to talk about it. The tech companies that empower us, they don't want to talk about it either because they can't guarantee their supply chains are often clean. So it remains an invisible conflict. And we, the people, don't even realize that we might well be stakeholders in this story. So I'm going to end here. This is Sandra. Sandra was raped when she was 16. She made it to the gates of the Pansy Hospital, only to find that she was pregnant and she had a miscarriage at the hospital. Then they found out she was HIV positive. But Sandra refuses to be a victim. She's become an advocate, a supporter of other women who have been through this adversity. She now writes songs and sings them and releases them out on local radio stations to inspire women and children who have been through this adversity. And I heard that she had written one song that was very powerful, and I asked her to sing it for me. And with your kind permission, I would like to read you the words from the translation. This is Sandra's voice. The, the song is called, My Body is Not a Weapon. If you look at me, you will see a woman who is smiling, a soul full of joy. And when you meet me on the street, you will never know that my heart is in pieces and my dreams are broken. In my world, I am only average. To hurt more? No. No. My body is not a weapon. My body is not their weapon. I also have a dream. I want to change everything. Within me, a small president is hidden who would change all inequalities. Within me, a small lawyer is hidden who would defend all the oppressed. A female doctor, a soul of joy. A soul that will link the North and the South. And if I don't make it, Mr. Photographer, can you ask someone to please change the world for me? Thank you for listening.